Hello everyone, I'm Ted Oakley. I'm managing partner at Oxbow and I'm really happy today to have somebody I've always wanted to talk to in person, Eric Townsend, who has uh, the podcast Macro Voices, which I would totally recommend all of you to go to go listen to every week. He has the best people on there. But Eric, welcome today. Thanks so much for having me on, Ted. It's good to see you. Yeah. Uh, one of the things people probably don't know about you, but you have tremendous experience up and really everywhere, but in particularly in oil. And I really, today, I wanted to really start uh, talking about where you see oil sort of now in the short run and the long run, the implications, because you have some really interesting ideas about the implications for oil. Yeah, this is an incredibly important time. And of course, as uh, as goes all things in the investment world, I could be wrong in what I'm about to say. But I think we've got some really, really clear signals telling us what's about to happen to the world. And I think that if you're able to understand those signals and see the, the writing on the wall, so to speak, it puts you in a really good position. What I mean by that is I think we've just discovered that the world is out of spare capacity. This in many ways is, uh, by spare capacity, I'm talking about the ability to produce more oil. It's not a question of the Saudis are not turning the, the dials up and, and making more. It's they can't make more because they're already making as much as they can. And we've reached a point where we're out of spare capacity and there hasn't been a whole lot of new investment, primarily because of the attitudes of governments around the world, really basically announcing that the fossil fuel business is going out of business because they've decided it for political reasons. And I'm all for the idea of phasing out fossil fuels in favor of phasing in something else. The problem is we seem to be trying to phase out the fossil fuels before we've finished phasing in the something else. And the result is going to be, I think, that, that we've discovered the world is now in the early stages of an energy crisis. We cannot recover from the pandemic. If we try to go back to pre-pandemic normal, what we would discover is there's not enough energy to su supply to meet that demand. Energy prices would go through the roof, it would cripple the economy, we'd find ourselves in an energy price-led recession. So I think that we are at the beginning stages right now of a global recession. The, the uh, genesis of that was you start with a pandemic, you overstimulate into the pandemic, so the stock market just goes up through the pandemic, then you run out of stimulus, now you're paying the price for the hangover for all that stimulus. And the result of that is going to be that as we try to recover the economy uh, back to normal, oil prices are going to go through the roof. And we've already seen that uh, right now because of this global recession, it's causing enough demand destruction that it's bringing prices down. Question is, how long do they stay down? And Saudi Arabia just gave us the cue this week when they said, look, it, it does look like an Iran deal is coming together. Congratulations, United States. So we'll be reducing our production in order to compensate for any Iranian production that comes back online. And of course, that sent oil prices off of their bottoms back up to the, what looks like maybe the beginning of a recovery here. Is the bottom in yet, Ted? I don't know. But what I do know is when this recession's over, uh, we're not going to be able to get back to good old normal because energy prices are going to be the limiting factor. So I think it's a, a really big story, but it's hard to trade. It's not straight up from here. We could easily see prices, you know, oil prices $10 lower on the recession, which I'm convinced is already here, before they eventually move much higher. And, you know, Eric, uh, what do you think, and I'm, I'm assuming, and I'm asking this question because I'm not certain today, but I'm assuming that the futures are still in backwardization. Uh, and why, why do you think that is? And for everybody out there that understands this, that means the futures prices, uh, they're lower than the cash price. But what do you, what, why do you think that is going on? Well, what's going on is it looks to me, just looking at, at my backwardation chart, which you can't see off the, the screen here, um, it looks to me like backwardation may have bottomed and is starting to come back into the market. But what we had was a situation where they literally couldn't figure out whether or not the industry was going to be able to get through settling that August contract. 
now everything's calmed down to the point where all of that fear has come out of the system as people realize that we are headed into a global recession it's going to cause a lot of demand destruction all of that speculations come out but another factor is the announcement of the government's intention to use long dated futures to replenish the SPR drawdowns now frankly I don't believe them I don't think they're really going to do that but the market's believing them and everybody's trying to front run the uh, the the, uh, the government and say well wait a minute if the government's going to buy long dated futures we should buy long dated futures now so we can turn around and sell them to the government uh, I think that eventually what we're going to find is we'll get back to uh, natural backwardation in the market but it's been temporarily suppressed by the combination of the recession and the people front running that trade and so let me and from that standpoint let me ask you on the strategic petroleum, petroleum reserve that you're talking about uh, why would you why, why would you think they would I mean you know it really didn't help all that much but I know you have some comments I've, I've listened to you before about the SPR but you might give your thoughts on that well, boy, you put your seatbelt on, as you know, Ted, for, for that one. I, I get a little bit uh, emotional about this. I think that you really have to stop and think about what is the purpose for which the strategic, strategic petroleum reserve was created. It was created after the 1970s oil embargo when the country realized, wait a minute, if we got cut off from energy, that could cripple us militarily. We would be in really deep doo-doo at that point. We better have some kind of slush fund for a rainy day. And they created the Strategic Petroleum Reserve so that if there was a geopolitical disturbance that cut the United States off from oil imports, that we would have uh, some, some temporary storage in order to get us through that. Now, people will argue, well, wait a minute, it was a totally different time. The U.S. was dependent on foreign imports for a much greater percentage of its energy use. We don't depend on foreign imports for as much as we used to. Well, you know what? If you look in absolute terms, I think we do depend on just as many barrels of oil being imported into the United States now as we do in the 1970s. It's just that that number of barrels is a much smaller percentage of the total because total consumption is much higher than it was back then. But you've still got this situation where most of the oil that's, um, uh, or, or you've got a situation where the oil that uh, is, I, I'm losing my, my train of, of thought here, but we, we have a situation where energy is going to become a much, much more important part of the economy. It's going to become a limiting factor on the economy. And I think it's probably going to lead to resource wars between nations before it's over. Which brings me to this question. I've heard some of your comments on this because I've listened to you all the time. But uh, give us your thoughts on, I, I don't think people realize maybe what the end game here is or what the game is with Russia relative to oil and natural gas. But I know you have some thoughts on that, uh, if you would um, to share those with us. Well, I don't necessarily have any conclusion or prediction of what's going to happen. My very strong feelings have been that the world is not taking the security risk that is created by this market situation seriously enough. We have a situation now already where energy prices are extremely high considering that we're at the beginning of a recession already. They were quite a bit higher just a couple of months ago. I think they're gonna go back to those high prices. So we, we've got a, a situation where energy prices are the, uh, uh, are the driving uh, force that, that I think could create a big, a, a big problem for the economy all by themselves. That's before anybody tries to mess with it. Now, if you look at the situation that we've put Vladimir Putin in, it's not him being a smart guy figuring out how to do this. It's us putting him in this situation. If he were to take his oil off of the market, just half of his oil off of the market, it would probably double the price, which means it would be revenue neutral for Russia to do that. 
and it, it would completely cripple the global economy. You could double the price of energy and shut down Europe. You, you, the, the euro would crash. You could do so much economic damage if you were intentionally trying to withhold energy from the global market, whether that be through embargoes, you know, physical, you know, Navy stopping ships from delivering oil, or if you just did it by taking some of Russia's oil exports off the market. We've created a situation where the geopolitical risk is extreme if somebody intentionally monkeys with energy prices, which they're not even doing yet. And it's happening at a time when we're seeing a geopolitical escalation that's really, I think, the biggest in our lifetimes. I think this is, uh, there, there hasn't been a time that we've been closer to outright nuclear escalation between superpowers since the nuclear uh, since the Cuban Missile Crisis, and at a time like that, we're drawing down the strategic petroleum reserve for the sake of trying to game gasoline prices between now and the midterm elections. I think that is recklessly irresponsible of the president to be using the strategic petroleum reserve, which is meant to protect the national security at a time when the national security, frankly, is in question for the sake of trying to buy votes, which is what I think has happened here. So let me ask you, and you, you know, you're breaking down this oil between the short term, which I think we've understood that, you know, if you get into uh, a deeper recession, it could break it, break it down, obviously, uh, further, sort of like, you know, 08, when you went from 140 to whatever that price was, 40 bucks or whatever. But uh, if you had to break down, let's say, get past the next 18 months or whatever goes on with this, this downturn we have, in the long run, I'm talking about, you know, five years or so, some, some longer term number, I'm, I think I'm hearing you say that, that oil would surpass that 140 mark back in 08. And maybe I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm just saying it's a question. I, I think it definitely will, but I don't think it's nearly as simple as oil price goes up. People who, who you know, bet on oil make money. I think what will happen is we will go back to that $147 price that was tested in 08. And we'll have a, a, a another experience like 08, which is when energy prices get to be that big of a percent of GDP, it cripples the economy and takes us back into recession. And you get into, you know, if you think about a debt trap where you're stuck in debt and you can't get out because every time you try to get out, it just makes it worse. You can get into an energy trap where energy prices, as soon as the economy begins to recover and demand picks up, energy prices go through the roof and crash the economy again back into recession. And you're stuck behind uh, energy prices basically being the crippling effect on the global economy. I think we're headed to that situation and we'll eventually figure it out and say, wait a minute, getting off of fossil fuels was a good idea, but we should continue to can, we should continue to invest in fossil fuels for as long as we need them until the replacement has really and truly been put into place, not just been promised into place as the, the case has been with electric vehicles. And, you know, at that point you say, okay, well, we, we got to do something to resurrect or keep the petroleum industry alive for just a few more years. Well, guess what, Ted, it takes years to, discover new oil fields and, and go through all of the work that it takes to get them into production. There's a pipeline that takes several years. At the rate we're going, by the time we recognize all the policy mistakes that we've made and say, holy crap, we need to produce petroleum. Yeah, it's it's the old stuff. It's going out of vogue. We're not going to have it in the new the new economy that we're trying to get to. But until then, we got to produce more of it and we don't have enough and we're in trouble. By the time we finally get that through our heads, I think we're going to be at the point where it takes several years to get out of an energy crisis, no matter what the policy is. And with that, I'm assuming that you think that would bring uh, a fairly high inflationary impact with it to in, in general, because you know, everybody thinks now, well, we're going to go back to normal inflation and you know, the Fed will come back in and loosen up. Everything's OK, but I'm not. I'm not certain you see it that way. Well, the cost of energy used to be an input to the price of everything. 
these days you got a few things like the software industry that don't depend on energy as much as other people do but energy is a basic input to the entire economy whatever it takes to to run the economy the the, the energy cost is a basic cost of operating the economy and whatever energy costs is that much money that's not available to be profit in something else uh, we're going to have to run the global economy on a tighter budget because energy is going to cost more than we're used to and it didn't have to be this way we got here through policy mistakes so my question to you then would be this and that would be if in fact uh, they don't do anything and then we get up against the wall uh, I'm assuming you don't see any way out of that other than the fact that you have to get uh, in trouble and then try to pull yourselves out. I don't, I'm assuming you don't see anybody having enough foresight to, to work on that. Yeah, I think that what we have to go through here is the world is going to get itself into big trouble, into a big energy crisis, and everybody's going to wake up and say, okay, wait a minute, all this green energy, uh, carbon neutral agenda stuff is the right idea. I hope we don't lose sight of it because it really is the right thing for the planet. But you can't just announce that you have these things and phase out fossil fuels because you announced that you have something that you don't really have yet. Getting to a new electric economy is going to depend on a new energy source to produce that electricity. I think we need to get realistic about uh, about the limitations of wind and solar and recognize that we need a nuclear renaissance. Now, a nuclear renaissance is a really big political bailiwick. The world is not ready to accept that yet. I think we have to go through a few years of really extreme pain where gasoline uh, prices in the United States are, you know, on the order of $10 and, and, and uh, you know, double that in Europe. Uh, when we get to those kinds of energy costs, people are going to put their feet down and say, look, uh, this whole green agenda is fine as long as you do it in a way that doesn't break the economy. Let's take a, a, our time about doing it right, not rushing through it the way we have. Um, that realization, when we get there, is when I think policy changes, there will be a politically uh, the people will speak and say, we're sick of this uh, green agenda being the priority over everything. Certain political leaders will get voted out. They'll be replaced. We'll have a newfound focus on producing more petroleum. But it still takes time to do all this stuff. We're still going to be behind the power curve trying to catch up. And it's going to result in really, really painfully high energy prices for a few years to come. Well, you know, remember, I know you remember this, that old saying about you freeze to, you freeze to death in the dark. And it had to do with, you know, if people, you know, if you had to feed your children and you keep them warm and all those sorts of things, all of a sudden energy, you know, you forget about a lot of things and, and you think about, okay, what, what do I need to do? And, and Eric, don't you think most people don't understand that how many parts of the world that, that, that you can't get electricity to, they have to have combustible engines and that sort of thing, that, that's all they have. Well, I, I don't know, I mean, we're at a, a moment in policy where, you know, in Canada right now, uh, Canada has the world's largest reserves of potash, which is needed to make the fertilizer, which is an extremely tight supply right now because of this situation between Russia and Ukraine. You would think that Canada would be stepping up to the rest of the world saying, hey, look, we've got the biggest potash reserves. We can put our fertilizer production into overdrive and we can supply the rest of the world with as much fertilizer as you need. And no, that's not what's happening in Canada. The Trudeau administration's on the exact opposite agenda of saying we need to reduce through government legislation. We need to reduce the amount of fertilizer that we produce in Canada and we need to stop using as much fertilizer as we've been using because the cows fart too much and that results in too much methane emissions and that's going to exacerbate global warming. Well, okay, that probably is a laudable goal, but we need to balance it against the energy needs of the entire planet. And I think we've got our priorities a little bit mixed up. So with that, going back to that inflation thing, then 
I'm assuming with what you're seeing or what you think you'll see, you know, generally with energy, uh, that you would not, I'm, I'm asking a question here, you, are you thinking that the inflation thing doesn't just go back, go away like it was four years ago or something like that, that, that uh, it stays with us in here? No, I think inflation is here to stay. The question is, we all know that obviously the pandemic uh, and the recovery from the pandemic, the, re the, the renewed demand as things are coming back online is exacerbating the inflation. Anybody can see that. Okay, the big question is how much of this massive spike that we've seen to 9% plus inflation prints, how much of that was post pandemic and how much of it was we're in a new secular inflation? Uh, you could argue all the way down to zero on the ladder. I think it's 50-50. I think that we are in a new secular inflation. I think the energy crisis and the food crisis are going to reinforce it. And I see enough reinforcing factors now that I think it's going to overcome the demographics and other factors that have kept us out of inflation for the last few decades. Thing is, uh, you know, inflation calls are really hard to get right. They only the, the, this is a, a tide that only changes every few decades. And I'm convinced the tide change is upon us. But if those tide changes can take a decade at a time to play out, you know, it's easy to, to, to be wrong if you, if you say it starts right now. Uh, I think that we're past that, that point of recognizing, though, that a new secular inflation period is on the horizon, if not already here. And with that, uh, Eric, would you, how would you feel about, since I'm looking at it that way, how would you feel about gold at this time? Gold continues to frustrate me. You know, everything that I and a lot of other people who were bullish on gold predicted was going to happen with the government uh, debasing the currency and printing more money and everything. It all happened. We, we got the prediction right. The only thing that didn't happen was gold. Okay, so... Our assumption that gold has always served for the last 10,000 years as the, the scarcity asset of choice seems to have been outweighed by cryptocurrency. Uh, I don't think cryptocurrency really provides the, the same safety uh, asset benefit that gold does, but a lot of people disagree with me. And the demand for gold is now being diluted into demand for both gold and cryptocurrency. And if you've got an asset whose entire argument for its value is based entirely on its scarcity, and all of a sudden something else is just as popular in the scarcity department, it almost has the effect of doubling the supply of gold, you know, because now you've got a supply of gold and cryptocurrency, which are both competing for the same investor dollars, even though I think the, the gold is more worthy of those dollars. Not everybody sees it that way. Yeah. Well, and the fact that maybe the cryptos are headed toward uh, the really low end, <laughs> they've given up a lot more percentage-wise, you know, over the last year or two. Uh, I, and I know exactly what you're saying, how you get the competition between the two uh, that go on there. So, uh, Well, I think that plays a really big role in what happens next for gold, because if crypto were completely washed out to the point where People just capitulated, washed their hands and said, boy, that whole crypto experience of the last decade was a big mistake, lost my money, learned my lesson, it's my, my Edsel. If it goes that way, then I think it's a setup for gold to at least double in price because the, the market really is has been there the whole time for gold to, to move up substantially. On the other hand, if crypto recovers here, and we see a new wave of crypto enthusiasm, I think it's gonna put a dent in gold for some time to come. Well, listen, Eric, uh, I know you're a busy person and I wanna recommend everybody again, and you've seen the, you will have seen the flag a few times now during this, <clears throat> during this interview where you can go to Macro Voices and I would really highly recommend you to listen into this podcast. It's one of the best and I'm, I'm telling you, Eric, you have, you have the greatest interviews you interview the best people. I, I don't know where you find them all, but they're always very, very interesting, and I recommend everybody to do that. But Eric, I want to thank you again, and I know you're busy, but thank you for taking the time to visit with us. Ted, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. All right. Hopefully we can see you in the next year or two. So thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you next time.